Okay, so welcome everybody. So let's see if we get an image. Can you see the slides already? Okay, so welcome everybody. Welcome to Interventional Medical Image Processing. And today we will have the last, no, the, not the last lecture, but the last content lecture of this term. And we will only have a final lecture, a last lecture on July 12th at four o'clock. And here we will have the topics of evaluation and questions and answers. And before you leave today, I have the transaction numbers here. And everybody can pick a transaction number when you're leaving. So I'll be handing them out here and everybody gets one. Good. Um, we were talking about ECG-gated reconstruction and motion-compensated reconstruction. So last lecture we learned that it's uh, all of the reconstruction theory that we have is essentially assuming that we have a static object. Now unfortunately patients are not static objects and we have to do something about it. And one idea that we looked at last time from 2006 is that you virtually freeze the heart. So we can do a reconstruction by virtually freezing the heart and we assume that we have the same heart motion in every heartbeat. So in order to reconstruct, we just take the same, we take the heart, but from different projection angles, and we only use the projection angles that were acquired in the same heart phase, then we put them all together and we can reconstruct. And the reason why we were doing this is because uh, typically in the interventional scenarios, you have scanners like the one shown on the slide, and this one is rotating around the patient. And of course, it has an open gantry. So you can see the detector in the tube mounted to the system. And you cannot rotate as quickly as you would do in a diagnostic scanner. In a diagnostic scanner, you can rotate about the patient in uh, four times a second. So there you can even take an image of the beating heart, a volumetric image of the beating heart, in let's say 60 milliseconds. However, in a system like this one, you have to rotate at least 200 degrees, and you cannot do this in a, in, a, uh, in, in a fraction of a second. And the reason why you can't do it is mostly because you don't want to hurt anybody. So the system could move technically really fast. It could do the motion maybe in one second or in two seconds, but typically you take much longer. And for a, a high resolution scan, you take up to 20 seconds. And in 20 seconds, a lot of motion can happen, in particular, if you have something like up to 180 beats per minute of a heart that is beating. So there is definitely motion. And now the idea that um, uh, Laurich and Farik came up with is that you create multiple sweep, sweeps, you rotate the C-arm back and forth, and by doing so, you acquire more and more data of the same heart phase, and at some point, you cover the entire angular range and you can select these projections to do a reconstruction. And this is actually possible, so you can actually buy this as a clinical product. However, typically, the heart is affected by a kind of disease. And if the heart is affected by disease, there is a certain likelihood that it will not be perfectly periodically uh, beating. So this is the reason why people came up with additional ideas how to compensate for this problem. And one solution is image-based gating. And image-based gating is, um, is a very interesting approach and uh, we can also write this up into a very nice optimization problem. So let's have a look. Can you, can you see the sinograms? So on the left-hand side you see a sinogram of an object that is static and you can really nicely see the sinusoidal curves. And on the right-hand side, you can see a sinogram that has quite some motion. And what you see is that this motion 
distorts these nice sinusoidal curves. And of course, if you reconstruct from that and you assume everything is following uh, a regular projection geometry, then you would be reconstructing artifacts and you would get severe streaking artifacts. So what can you do is, well, you can think about if we had an acquisition like previous one, we have multiple images taken at every projection angle. So we have several candidates at every projection angle. And we can then also think about if we can rearrange a quasi-static reconstruction, a quasi-static sinogram. And now the idea is that you can describe the change of the image content as the sinogram motion. So you have the motion as shown here in the sinogram. This is the kind of expected motion. And then in addition, you have the cardiac motion. So there is something happening additionally. And now the idea is, well, if we take a projection at angle i and at angle i plus 1, then the difference should be small because there is only one, let's say, one degree or one and a half degrees of rotation between the two projections. So they are somehow similar. But now if there is the rotation but additional heart motion, they will be less similar. So you can actually do that and take an angulation alpha here in phase, heart phase 73%. Uh, and then you compare two projections at angulation alpha plus, let's say, one degree. And you take the phase 70% and the phase 23%. Then you will realize that this one and this one, they are very similar. There is almost no signal if you just subtract the two projections. So there is very little signal that is only introduced by the rotation. Now, in this case here, you have the original heart phase and a very uh, original angulation and additionally a very different heart phase. So there is the rotation plus the change in the heart phase, which causes some considerable signal. So you can see that there is much more mass in the difference image than in this image. So this is almost black, and here you can see some white structures. So we can somehow define a similarity between the two images. And we expect images, although they are taken from a different projection, to be more similar if they are in the same heart state. So what we can do now is we can find um, this as a graph optimization problem. So what we do is we start with the begin angle, and then we rotate by one degree and one degree and one degree. And in every row here, we put one of the sweeps. So this is all sweep one, this is all sweep two, this is all sweep k. Yeah? We are still in the same kind of acquisition scheme than earlier. So we're rotating back and forth, and every time we rotate forward, uh, forward and backward, we're creating one sweep. Technically, one sweep is sufficient to do an entire reconstruction. But now we have the hard motion in between. And what do we do? Well, we take every image and compare it to all the other image in the next angulations. And we take this image and compare it to all the other images in the next angulation, so in the next angle step. If we do that, we can set up a graph and every edge in this graph, every node in this graph is one projection image. And now every edge in this graph is the transition from one angle to another. So every path from left to right will give us one reconstruction that contains all the required projection angles. So we have to rotate about 200 degrees until we have a complete reconstruction. So if we follow this path, we will have exactly the data from sweep one. And now we can also switch between the different paths. And now the idea is, if I look for the shortest path, that is the path that has the least difference in rotating images, that will give us a reconstruction that has fewest artifact. So we can use something like Dijkstra to compute the shortest path in this image path. And in this kind of setup, we don't need any ECG information at all. We only implicitly measure a surrogate of the ECG by the difference of projection images. 
By the way, you can also use this uh, information and use it in a machine learning or dimensionality reduction approach, and you can data-driven extract a surrogate of the hard face only from a sequence of projection images. So if the dominant motion in the image is actually the heartbeat, then you can really extract a surrogate of the ECG signal only from the projection images, even in a rotational sequence. Even if you rotate about the object, you can still extract a surrogate of the hard face. And here we use this very simple approach and then find a shortest path through our projection angles, and every path is, of course, a complete scan, and then we can reconstruct it. One thing that you really have to care about is typically paths are preferred with minimal jumps across sweeps because the neighboring images are just very similar. So if you include uh, some additional prior knowledge that you have to jump uh, at a certain point, then you can even put that in there and you can force the algorithm to jump in between points. So you can, for example, take out connections. And if you do that, then you can really extract a motion-compensated image and reconstruct without additional knowledge about the ECG signal. So here is uh, some result from an animal study that we con conducted together with Stanford University. And we took six sweeps, 191 projections per sweep, and one sweep acquisition took four seconds. The detector matrix size was uh, 620 by 480, which is a 4 by 4 binning, which allows a very high frame rate. Uh, so here we have rather high frame rates. And if you do that, you can compare this now between those two images, and you see this is a regular ECG-gated image, and this is an image-based gated image, and they look somewhat similar. Can you see the details? Should I shut down the light in the front? Okay, and now you can see that um, this performs rather okay. So we have a quite good, a quite comparable image quality. And here you can see the heart rate, and the heart rate in this case is 93 to 95 beats per minute. So this is also a rather stable heart rate. Now, we also did um, an expert study and here you can see a case where we have the ECG-gated and the image-based method. And here we had a quite variable heart rate from uh, 60 to 105 beats per minute. So the heart rate was changing during this acquisition. And you can see that in the image-based version, we could get much more homogeneous impression here while you observe quite a bit of artifact. Can you see this artifact here? So this is introduced by the non-periodic motion. So this is not very well gated, but in the image-based gating, we can get a much better image quality with this kind of approach. So if you really have some variable heart rate in the acquisition, you can do this image-based gated and get much better reconstruction results. Okay, so let me turn on the light. Well, one drawback of this image-based gated is um, we are not using all the projections that are available for a single reconstruction. So, so far, we are only taking one path and we have acquired much more data than we were actually using for the reconstruction. So, maybe there's even better ways to reconstruct. And we will see actually uh, towards the end of this set of slides how we can actually use all the data for a single reconstruction. Good. Well, another thing that we can do is we can play with the ECG gating. So we've just seen that we have phases where the heart is moving quicker and phases where the heart is moving less quick. And what we can do now is, well, um, ECG motion is something we may want to drop and also the periodicity is something we may want to drop. So let's come up with a new model assumption. And let's say it should be a continuous and temporal smooth. And one way that we can achieve that is we can actually, we, so let's say we have the, the heart motion and we know there are phases that are faster and other phases that are 
not as fast, that are rather slowly varying. So what we could do is instead, so what we previously did is we were just using essentially um, a rectangular window and we were just using all of the projections from this rectangular window. But instead we can take something like a cosine shaped window and use the ones in the center of the hard state and uh, just use this one and the neighboring projections we weigh down with a certain factor that follows this cosine. And what we can do now is we can determine the width of this window with a, with a search algorithm. Uh, so we can say in phases where we have, the, where the heart is moving faster, we want this window to be very narrow because the next projections will be very different. And in phases where the heart is moving very slowly, then we can open up this window. Then we can make the window broader. So we can find a way to parameterize this window and also adjust uh, the width of this window um, with a parameter. What we can do next is then we can perform a gated reconstruction where we assign this kind of weight. So this is our weight lambda. And this kind of weight is of course for every projection i and it has some window parameters SGA. And SGA essentially select the width of this window. What we can do now is we can perform a augmented gated reconstruction where we have the element that we want to back project over the, FDA, uh, of the, over the FDK algorithm and we weight it with this window function. So if we do that, we can multiply in every update in the back projection. Now n is the number of projections and this is just the sum over all of the projections. And here we apply this weighting for every projection. If we do that, then we end up with a kind of windowed gated reconstruction. Now we can say, well, we can take this reconstructed volume. So this is our reconstructed volume then. And we can also create a virtual projection again. So you take the reconstructed volume and forward project it to the original measured projections. So you, you virtually create um, something that is called a DRR, uh, so a digitally rendered radiograph. So you project your current volume state back to the domain of your image and then you just subtract the two. So you have the rendered image and the measured image and you subtract the two and sum up the square of the distances. Uh, so this is a kind of uh, SSD measure which we call Q. So what we can do now is we can uh, compute the weighted sum for all of these images and we additionally weight it with the original weight of the respective um, of the respective frame. So for every frame, we can subtract the two and sum up over the entire image, and then we can sum up over the entire set of projections. And of course, uh, we want to neglect the frames, the, image, the projection images that did not contribute to this reconstruction. So if they were zeroed out by our weight, we don't want to compute them in the error measure because they didn't contribute to the reconstruction. This is why we do this additional weighting here. And if we do that, we can set up a objective function L here. And this objective function, we can then minimize with respect to our window sizes. And if we do that, um, we can then set up the optimization problem. We can do, for example, a grid search and sample at 300 points and then start a local gradient descent. Of course, you have to be aware you uh, still need to model uh, your forward projection, you could use um, DRRs, that would be a, a ray caster, or you could also use maximum intensity projections. Well, then one thing that you could do is pre-processing. Th this really depends on the application that you're aiming at. If you're, recon if you're aiming, for example, uh, of a reconstruction of only the coronary arteries, just a high co contrast reconstruction, then you may want to compute this error only over the coronary arteries and not over the remaining image. And then of course you can use instead of the uh, 
sum of squared differences, you can also use normalized cross correlation, root mean square errors, uh, or um, other error metrics. Very well. And if you do that, you can already see quite some improvement. So if you go ahead, and this is a standard uh, periodic ECG-gated coronary reconstruction. So these are the coronary arteries. Uh, if you want to reconstruct something like this, you have to inject contrast agent into the arteries of the heart. These are the uh, arteries that supply the uh, heart muscle with blood. And here you can see that the ECG-gated version is already quite OK. But if you have a case where the heart is not beating in a periodic way, then you reconstruct something like this. So your ECG gating fails. Now you can use this um, additional adaptive windowing, and you can get a much better reconstruction than this. So in the non-periodic case, you can use these adaptive window sizes. Can you actually see the images? This it's high contrast, so you can see it even. There's not much to see in the center image. Yeah. So this is a pretty bad image quality. And here you can even see that we can still get something if we use this adaptive windowing. Good. What else can we do? Well, we can, of course, uh, look at Spearman's rank correlation and use some quantitative, num uh, quantitative numbers and see that we, here, we clearly outperform uh, the traditional ECG-gated method. Good. And another thing that is quite interesting is that if you even use a, a, an eight-core machine and some uh, graphics card, you can do one function evaluation in this case. And this is pretty old hardware. So this is five years ago that we were using this hardware in 300 milliseconds. And uh, in order to get to the optimum, you need about uh, 1,000 cost function evaluations. So doing so, we have created one static reconstruction that is using this adaptive gating. So what we now want to do is uh, we want to do an ECG-gated motion compensation. And the idea that we want to do here is we want to use all of the information. And if we want to do that, what we are going to do is we have to deform the volume. Uh, so we reconstruct at phase number one. And then we can estimate a deformation from phase number one to phase number two. Let's say we have 10 hard phases. So we reconstruct phase number one with a, um, with a ECG gated reconstruction. And we can shift this window. Yeah? Remember that we can, of course, select a different hard state. So we can do ECG gated reconstructions for every, period, for every part of the hard phase. And then we can estimate the deformation between the hard phases. And if we do so, if we estimate the deformation, then we can use the information from the neighboring heart state, deform it to the current heart state, and add them up. So we get more signal-to-noise ratio. So we get a better reconstruction. And this way, we can create one reconstruction where we have only shown a single heart phase, but we're using all of the information from the entire scan. And of course, this deformation we can estimate with a non-rigid registration approach. Now, if we do that, we can initialize with our, with our ECG gated and windowed uh, reconstruction. And then we need um, to estimate the deformation during our scan. And if we do so, we can then start forward projecting our point, because the, the point in time phase one will then, of course, be moving. Yeah. So if you, if you consider um, several time points and you're rendering then, your point in 3D will actually, actually be moving in the volume. And if you think of your moving point, then you can also think of that the point is also moving. Uh, if you had a static, static viewpoint, then your point would be moving all the time because the heart is beating. Yeah? OK. And now we can also set up an optimization problem here and also determine the 
optimal parameters here with respect uh, to the motion. So what we did here is we were modeling the motion between the different frames as a B-spline. And this B-spline, um, oh, sorry. We are modeling this as a time-dependent um, affine mapping. And we did a B-spline interpolation. We had a total of 18 time samples. And this led us uh, to a 216-dimensional search space. And if we did that, we found that we can do a function evaluation on a grid that is uh, 128 cubed within only 40 milliseconds. And you can find um, a reconstruction within at about 10,000 function evaluations, which led to a reconstruction time of about seven minutes. And at the, if you think about seven minutes, this is something that you really can do at the clinical side. So you can really do that in, uh, within an intervention if it matches your workflow. And here you can see some examples of the uh, non-motion compensated. So this is just an ECG-gated reconstruction, and this is a reconstruction that was using the full motion field deformation. Good. And in a summary, so what you can do is you first create um, a, a reference for the motion estimation. So you measure your projections. Then you do some initial ECG-gated reconstruction. Then you can segment the vasculature, so your higher contrast objects. And this gives you a sparse reference image. And if you do that, then you can start with a 4D, um, um, with a 4D non-periodic motion estimation. And you can update your motion fields and iterate this until you have found a reconstruction and the corresponding motion fields. Good, and this would then the, be the entire, um, the entire optimization function. Here are some clinical results. So this is a coronary sinus, and here are coronary arteries reconstructed. So you can see this works even with different vasculature, and also in cases where you have quite complex coronary anatomy. Good. So, so far, we've seen uh, ECG gating, and we've seen that the ECG gating um, will work uh, if we have a periodic motion, and we can really reconstruct volumetric images. And then we've seen if we do volumetric imaging and the ECG gating, uh, if the heartbeat is not periodic, the ECG gating will lead to worse image results. So we introduced um, our idea with the image-based gating, and then we could still re reconstruct, um, then we could still reconstruct a volumetric image. So we really had slice images. Then we've seen we can also start uh, reconstructing only the coronary arteries. So we are actually aiming for something that is more or less a symbolic reconstruction. We are only interested in a high contrast reconstruction that shows the coronary arteries. And there we can then uh, use an adaptive windowing, and we can speed up the entire computation process by only looking at the area that is close to the coronary arteries. So we do a background-foreground segmentation, and we can then automatically try to estimate the window size, which already gave us an improved reconstruction. And then we introduced the modeling of the 3D motion fields using B-splines, and we could then at the same time model the motion field and the reconstruction of the high contrast object, which gave us a 4D reconstruction of this high contrast object. Good. Now I want to continue with another set of slides where we even drew, drew these ideas further. So at this point, we know how to reconstruct high contrast structure, structures. But of course, we are also interested in the entire volumetric images. So we are not only interested in the coronary arteries, but we are also interested in the uh, slice images of the heart. And one idea that is um, very recent and was actually uh, just published last year is using some ideas to deal with the temporal inconsistency. So 
here is again the example with the C arm, and you can see on the left hand side the scanner, and on the right hand side the kind of projections that we're dealing with. And what we want to do now is, in contrast to what we've seen previously, we use this back and forth sweeping. So we had several sweeps. And what we want to do now is reconstruct with only one sweep, just a single sweep. So we want to omit this back and forth uh, sweeping procedure. So what we do now is, well, previously we had four second sweeps and they are, for this application, they won't be enough. So we in increase the duration of the sweep and go to 14.5 uh, seconds duration and we acquire a total of almost 400 projection images. So in order to omit the issue with the periodicity, we can do something that is called pacing. So pacing is when you attach an electrode to the heart and you make it beat in a regular way. And here we are using a uh, this pacing and set it to 115 beats per minute. So now we have a regularized heartbeat because we have this pacemaker and the pacemaker will cause the heart to beat exactly at this, um, uh, at this frequency. So this is a kind of invasive imaging procedure and this may only be suited for certain applications where you really have access and that you can actually pace the heart. But if you do that, you can get a very re regular heartbeat. So here we do 27 heartbeats and we will have 27 distinct views per heart phase. And now what we want to do is we want to interest, uh, inject a contrast bolus and this uh, contrast bolus is injected uh, into the pulmonary artery and then we want to get a more homogeneous contrast. So we want to get a, a homogeneous um, contrast in the ventricle. This is also quite difficult to achieve, so you need quite a bit of experience to get a homogeneous contrast inside the beating heart. And now we can do retrospective ECG gating. So we select the 27 views according to the ECG gate and reconstruct with these uh, 27 beats. So when we do that, we will get a reconstruction that is severely undersampled. From only 27 views, you get a terrible image quality. But luckily, um, you can do motion compensated reconstruction and this works very similar to what I've uh, shown you earlier. So you really do a reconstruction of the individual faces and then you do a 3D, 3D registration in between the two faces in order to estimate the motion in between. And then you can do the inverse transform and map them back to the original state and get a uh, much improved reconstruction. Good, so the first thing is we do an initial reconstruction using ECG gated, then we do 3D 3D registration for the motion estimation and then we do a motion compensation which applies the inverse deformation during the back projection. Here is some example. Here is the reconstruction only from the ECG gating. And should I improve the contrast? I guess I improved the contrast. So on the top image, you can see only the result of the ECG gating. And you can admire that this is a pretty poor image quality. In the lower image, you can see what happens if you apply the deformation fields. So we are using this 3D, 3D registration and then we're using all the data to reconstruct in a single phase. And you can see the contrast is dramatically improved. And if you look at the lower image, then you will realize that there is a lot of flickering going on. Can you, do you observe all the flickering that is going on in the lower image? So there is some kind of artificial motion that is in between the different motion states. And we can very clearly say that uh, there should be no motion. Yeah? And the motion has also very strange frequencies. So you can see in the heart, we have this expansion and contraction of the heart chamber. And that follows a regular pattern, that follows a regular frequency. But outside the heart, there is a kind of wind blowing. Yeah? You see, this is not correlated with the Mahat motion and it's somehow flickering and looks like there's something, some uh, wind blowing. And what we can do now is um, 
we can use this temporal context. So, so far we haven't used this temporal context in volume domain. And you can here, if you go up to a 3D um, visualization, you can very nicely observe that there is, uh, let me turn off the light again. You can very nicely observe that you have a lot of motion going on. And in the bottom right, in the, in the volume rendering, you can see that you, well, first of all, you can see that there's not too much cardiac activity in here. So this is, um, uh, there is, well, there is some change in the volume, but you can really see the contrast flow in the bottom right image. And you can see all of this flickering going on that is probably artificial. So what we want to do next is we want to get rid of this. And what do we do? Well, they jump over time. And we are pretty sure that this is not very physiologic, right? So the heartbeat is something we can explain. But this strange intensity jumping and this flickering is probably not physiologic. What can we do is, well, we can do a smoothing of a temporal domain. So we just smooth between two images. But if we do that, um, we can see that we would also smooth out the heart motion. If we smooth too strongly, we will have a static state, but it will be all smeared in the case where the motion is. So what we want to do is, we want to use um, a kind of motion map in order to figure out what's going on. And we want to identify those voxels that should have motion and those voxels that should be static. And here is uh, some approaches in literature that already try to do this in using iterative approaches. And here we want to do a heart rate informed 3D motion detection for adaptive temporal smoothing. So this is um, also a contribution from our lab. And what we will do is, we will do a Gaussian smoothing in temporal domain, but the idea is that we make it dependent, we make our standard deviation dependent on whether we expect heart motion in this voxel or not. And if we don't expect heart motion in this voxel, we stake a very broad temporal smoothing. So we almost keep everything static. And if we expect heart motion, we will make it very narrow and smooth very little over the time domain. So this is a nice idea, but how do we actually identify voxels that actually beat uh, in the heart? So how can we do that? Well, um, the key idea is in the projections, we can also observe this motion. And we've already seen that this image-based gated image based gating also has some information about the, about the heartbeat. And the other nice idea is in the projection domain, I have a very high temporal resolution. So I'm reconstructing maybe five volumes, maybe six volumes, but they have a very low temporal resolution because these uh, five volumes are uh, sampled over the entire heartbeat. But every single projection is taken at 30 frames per second. So I have a very high heart rate, uh, I have a very high frame rate in the projection domain. And we know the frequency. In this case, we can even set it because we're using pacing. And we know very precisely the frequency of the heart. So what do we do? Well, you can take one voxel. And if you take this voxel and project it over all your projections, over all your almost 400 projections, you can look at the intensity profile at the projected point. And one thing that you will see is, you will see that this uh, follows a curve, a very smooth curve. And this smooth curve is introduced by the body of the patient. So if you start looking from this side, uh, if you start looking from this side, you will have a very high intensity, then you rotate by 90 degrees, you have a lower intensity, you rotate by another 90 degrees, and you will have a high intensity again, because the base shape of your patient is elliptical. But then you can also see this modulated motion in here. Can you see this, low, uh, this high frequency motion that is also introduced here? And this is another source of motion. And now the idea that we are using is we will take this profile and we do a frequency analysis. And if the voxel is associated with the heart, if it lies within the heart, we will have a very high response in the spectrum at the position of the heart rate. 
because if the voxel is within the heart, the projection will be, um, will be affected by the heart motion. And in this way, we can create a forward projection of all the voxels and see if we have in the, in the, fr in the spectrum of this intensity curve over all the projections, we can then see if we see a high peak at the heart rate. And if we see it, it's probably within the heart. And actually, you can do that and then set up a likelihood, and you will get such likelihood masks. So here you have a lot of motion that is linked to the heart rate. And you can see that you can use this likelihood field to very nicely figure out where the heart is in your volume. So we now can, only by knowing the heart rate, we can figure out which voxels are changing with the heart rate and which voxels are not. And if we do that, we can get a very nice volumetric mask, and we can use this volumetric mask to steer the temporal denoising. Can you see that, actually? It's better this way? Yeah. So we can automatically, just data-driven, only by knowing the heart rate, derive this mask. And then we can go ahead and uh, do some low median filtering and some blur filter and some normalization, but we essentially uh, do a temporal smoothing using our motion detection. So what do we do then? Well, we generate the images uh, with and with um, out temporal smoothing and then perform the motion estimation and compensate on both. And then we can compare the final images. And here you can see uh, some results uh, where we did just the temporal smoothing on the left-hand side, you can see just the temporal smoothing, and you can see you get a very stable image, but the heart motion is somehow affected uh, in, a very, uh, in a very unnatural way. Yeah? You can see all this wobbling on the left-hand side, so there is, um, here you can see uh, there's this high contrast object that is also deformed quite a lot. And here on the right-hand side, we are using this motion mask to steer the um, temporal smoothing, and you can see that we get a much better impression um, and a much more stable heart motion. And here we have an animation that consists of 10 phases for the cardiac cycle. Yeah, here you see the difference in between those two states. And here's some volumetric rendering, and you can see that, again, on the uh, right-hand side, you have this informed temporal smoothing, and on the left-hand side, well, we got rid of the flickering, flickering that we've seen earlier, but on the left-hand side, we have this very strange motion occurring, and we have this. This looks not very physiological, and if you look at the spine, you can see that the heartbeat is also affecting the spine, and it's moving through here, and here we have a much better behavior of the spine. Uh, there is still some effect on the rib cage. You can see this is all, this is undesired motion, but we can get a pretty good reconstruction. And this is not using any uh, iterative method so far. So this is all just uh, a filtered back projection type method. So it's very efficient, and you can reconstruct rather quickly. So here you can see the difference between the two. Here's another example, and also you can see here that in this area you have this wobbling, which is much better regularized on the right-hand side. And here's a volumetric rendering, and just from visual inspection, you would argue that the right-hand side looks much more physiologic, and you would trust the right-hand side probably more than the left-hand side. Okay, and then another thing that you can do is um, we can do iterative motion estimation and compensation, which is also, which also helps. So previously we, we did a reconstruction by reconstructing, then we were estimating the motion and then we were compensating it, and we can use some tricks like this, um, uh, like this um, motion aware 
uh, motion detection and then regularization approach. But in addition, we can also use an iterative reconstruction of our motion fields. Because if we do a first initial motion estimation, then we can already get uh, one image reconstructed. Then we do motion compensation, and of course we have better images then. Why not uh, add this regularization, as we previously seen, and then estimate the motion again? Because then we probably get a much better motion estimate. And you can actually do a couple of these iterations, and you can even improve more on image quality. So we do uh, an iterative procedure of this. And it, this, of course, involves multiple 3D, 3D registrations and multiple reconstructions. So now we're getting more and more complex, and at this point, we're requiring more and more hardware acceleration and very efficient graphics boards to be able to compute this in a rather short time. So if we do that, um, we can also do a kind of filtering. And here we choose, uh, instead of just using a simple temporal Gaussian, we can also do a bilateral filter of the Gaussian and um, just see the difference in between the two states. So we have uh, the traditional bilateral filter would be the top equation. And here in the bottom equation, we additionally expanded with the distance between two different time states. So you can also do a bilateral filter in the direction of time. Good, and if you do that, you can see on top a um, regular reconstruct. So on top you see a phantom image. This is from XCAT, and this is, so we use the phantom image because then we can quantitatively um, access, assess the image quality. And uh, on the lower hand, you can see a motion compensation with several iterations on the right hand side. And on the left hand side, we were only uh, seeing a single pass of regular motion compensation. And you can see the image quality improves uh, if you do three iterations. So it's, it's worth to repeat this for a couple of times because then the result will be even more stable. So this brings us to the summary. So we have here two methods for improving uh, temporal consistency, one based uh, with motion detection and then adaptive temporal smoothing. And on the bottom, the second version was motion estimation, compensation, and then the time domain regularization using a bilateral filter. And of course, you can use the top method also in the bottom approach to get even better image quality results. Okay, good. This concludes our overview on reconstruction of cardiac images in the interventional suite. So we've seen that starting from a very simple approach with ECG gating, we could then deal with non-periodic images, with non-periodic sequences, with, uh, using the image information, but we still had to acquire several sweeps. And then we were saying, okay, with several sweeps, we can't really uh, reconstruct. Uh, we have a lot of excess dose, which brought us to the coronary reconstruction, where we were only using a single pass. So already in the coronary reconstruction, where we had this high, crust, high contrast object, we were only using a single sweep for reconstruction. But in this case, um, we were only able to reconstruct the high contrast information and we were adaptively assessing, uh, so we were then adaptively controlling the width of the ECG windows. Then we introduced a motion field that we were modeling with B spines, and then we could get already a decent reconstruction of the high contrast structures. And then we expanded this further, where we used some tricks, where we used pacing in order to regularize uh, the heart rate. But if we do that and go to a slightly longer acquisition protocol, we can even get a 4D reconstruction of the beating heart with really slice images where you also have some uh, soft contrast information. Uh, so uh, this is uh, essentially the summary, summary of 10 years of work at our lab where we started and where we ended up essentially last year. So 
there has been some progress in the field over the last few years. Good. Do you have any questions? Yes. Yes. Okay, so first of all, this will only work in a multi-sweep protocol. Yeah? So we're back to the early stage where we're really acquiring multiple sweeps of the heart and then we're rearranging them. Otherwise, you don't get multiple projections for the same projection angle. So you really have to have a multi-sweep protocol. And the, what we've shown at the later stages, we were only using a single sweep for the entire reconstruction. And in, in terms of similarity, this is, of course, something uh, you need to, uh, to explore. In our case, it worked pretty well just taking differences between the two projection images. So we're just taking, well, you apply the pre-processing, and then you just take the difference between the projection images. How much latency? Uh, what do you mean with latency? Uh, for example, for a normal sweep, when you take uh, just one image for each angle, you have the number of frames. Five seconds or two seconds uh, for actually acquiring all of the images. And in this case, when we uh, take more than one image, how much time does it take for taking the whole image? So one sweep, and, and the protocol that we presented um, took four seconds. If you have six sweeps, it's uh, six times four seconds plus, I think, one and a half seconds uh, turnaround. So if you end at the sweep, then the image buffers are full and the buffers have to be flushed. And it takes one and a half seconds to get all the data out to be able to t uh, take the next sweep. So in total, um, yeah, it's about 30 seconds. And 30, 30 seconds is already hard because we are assuming no breathing motion in here. So if you were to apply this, you need a patient that is able to hold his breath for 30 seconds. We're not doing any breathing motion compensation here. So if you really, also with the, with the 14 second protocol, it's, uh, well, if you have patients that are ventilated anyway, you can turn off the ventilation for 14 seconds and then turn it on again. Uh, I mean, if you have patients that undergo pacing, then you also have to place the pacing electrodes. And in this case, uh, it's not that hard. But uh, any additional breathing motion will spoil your scan. So if you do it with free breathing, and if the, uh, if the patient is not under complete uh, anesthesia, then you really have to think about it. And of course, with these protocols, we are still in the research phase. With this 14-second protocol, uh, this is not yet a product. Be and one reason why it's not yet a product is why pacing is not popular with all the physicians. So some like pacing because you have a very good control of the patient and um, yeah, it's, it's useful, but there's also other schools then you're really into the different schools of um, cardiac radiology where they like to do a certain procedure in this way or this way. Uh, and then there is, you're not, so it's not entirely clear which way of treatment is actually the best way to go. And uh, some schools do it in this way and other schools do it in this way. Uh, and if you would want to have a product, obviously, obviously you need to satisfy all the schools because you're putting a product for a specific procedure. Yes? Technically, it, technically, you could expand this method to work without pacing. But then again, if you're working with a lab that is working with pacing, <laughs> you first have to get your hands on uh, some data that is not using the pacing. 
So, and if your physician says, okay, if I do pacing, I have the best patient outcome, uh, you will probably not ask him uh, to turn off the pacing or not do the pacing. Uh, but uh, pacing makes it more simple. So we are quite happy that we could solve the pacing case. And um, yeah, without pacing is uh, future work. <laughs> probably the next PhD thesis. <laughs> more questions? If there are no more questions about the contents, then um, I have transaction numbers here, and you can go ahead and uh, score the lecture. Um, yeah, j just just one remark, um, uh, a couple of remarks. Uh, don't write insults and such stuff. Uh, yeah, it doesn't help. You know, uh, it doesn't help me. Um, doesn't help you. It's probably one of you who wrote the insult. <laughs> okay, doesn't help. Yeah, try to be try to be objective, and uh, of course, we are very happy if you give us uh, hints on how to improve the lecture, and uh, we would be very happy, of course, to improve the lecture. Okay, yeah, and uh, everybody of you uh, has evaluated lectures before, yeah. So you know, is there anybody who has not evaluated a lecture before? Should I show you how to do it? Yeah, you, you take the best score all the time and then you press submit. <laughs> okay, just joking. Then um, see you for the evaluation summary and the question and answer session on July 12th, right before the written exam. Okay, good. Other than that, um, yeah, happy afternoon.